Welcome everyone to the 2023 annual membership meeting of the CHSA. My name is Brian Larson. I am a member of the Science Advisory Board and also been guest chair for the meetings um, for the last four years. Today, we're going to hear from Dr. Farshad Malufi and um, his background is uh, he uh, received a doctor of veterinary medicine degree in 1991 from the University of Tehran. Um, he did a residency at, in uh, theriogenology at Western College of Veterinary Medicine and uh, a master of science degree at the Department of Large Animal Clinical Sciences at the University of Saskatchewan and is currently, um, excuse me, currently associated with the Clyder Veterinary Services in Langley, British Columbia. Uh, the title of his talk is the ICSB, the International Reference for Conservation of the Caspian as an Endangered Equine Breed. Before we start, however, I'm going to turn this over to Sarvi and uh, just to make some opening comments about our, our meeting and how we conduct the meeting. Thank you, Brian. Sorry. Thank you, Brian. Um, so as moderator of the upcoming webinar, I want to ensure that we have a smooth and productive event for all our participants. We all want to get started, so I will keep, the, keep this short uh, and get right to it. There are some basic gram rules that I, I sent all of you uh, before the webinar. Hopefully you all read it. Here are some guidelines to help you uh, with your participation in the webinar. So please be respectful and courteous towards your fellow attendees and speaker. Anyone speaking at a turn or yelling will be muted or removed. Please keep your questions and comments to the topic we're discussing. If you have a question, please raise your hand, which is with the, uh, uh, I think it's the reactions, reactions icon at the bottom of your screen and you can raise your hand or you can just type it into the chat. When we get to your question, you are welcome to unmute yourself uh, to speak or you can continue typing in the chat. Um, be respectful of others and of time. So we have a very limited time. Um, if we cut you off or we don't get to your questions, we apologize and we will do our best to cover everyone's questions. And if we can't get to it in an hour that we have, we'll reach out to you in the next week. If you encounter technical issues, please chat me directly uh, and I'll do my best to help you out. Um, and we truly value your feedback after the event. You'll have an opportunity to share your thoughts and suggestions for upcoming future improvements. They'll be emailed out within the next week. Thank you for your cooperation and active participation in our webinar. Let's make this a valuable and enriching experience for all. With that, I will pass it to Dr. Malufi to start. Uh, thank you very much, Sarvi and <clears throat> Brian. Um, it's an honor to be uh, uh, with you guys, and um, I hope I can share some um, some of my ideas and my uh, understanding about <clears throat> the ICSB and uh, the importance of it uh, to share with you. Uh, so uh, I thought I better start with very very basic uh, and just to review what is a, a start book. Um, basically, it's a written record of. Uh, information for that specific uh, type of animal or breed that uh, is our uh, focus or interest. Uh, the main point here that everybody should probably pay more attention is this is basically the breeder who is reporting this information. So uh, all the uh, information that is coming, how valid they are, how accurate they are, basically is on the breeder. So I'm pretty sure there are lots of you guys who are involved with the breeding, you are owning the horses. Please pay attention that uh, the value of the start book, the accuracy of it, it depends how you provide the information and how you keep up with uh, 
correcting and uh, adjusting that information as uh, time passes by. Studbook basically is an official reference for all of people who would be interested to uh, work with that type or breed of animal. Uh, some of the information that uh, we need to provide, which are very important, are, are uh, those identifiers. Uh, it's very important, the horse's name, uh, markers, uh, markings, uh, color, sex, age, uh, breed, if there is a microchip number, all these things are provided to the registrars of your national or regional uh, um, member society accurately and correctly. Uh, when it comes to pedigree, uh, these days, of course, DNA has uh, become a great uh, tool for us, but it's still it's very important if you have got a farm start book, if you've got a notebook at your farm, make sure you keep track of those pedigrees and uh, it would never hurt to have a uh, double uh, note, uh, one with at your start book at your farm and one with your national uh, registry. Uh, there are many other uh, important elements that are also recorded on a start book. Um, some of them that uh, some of you might have had issue with them are um, sales, uh, export, uh, import, uh, transfer of ownership, and the issues that come with that. Uh, it's very important that everybody understands uh, these notes about the, the ownership or transfer of ownership are just recorded here. No stud book would be a valid reference for going to a court or uh, uh, claiming that uh, because my horse is under my name on a stud book, that's my uh, legal right to that horse. All right, so uh, with this uh, introduction, I would like to open the idea that we have two types of start books. Uh, one is a closed start book, the other one is an open start book. Basically, a good example of closed start book would be the start book that is used for uh, thoroughbreds. Uh, these type of start book absolutely stops introduction of any other uh, outside bloodlines into that group of animals. Uh, it's an easy way to keep track of uh, what's happening. Uh, the, uh, basically all the animals must go back to the foundation stock. In case of uh, throwbread, it was like those uh, Bayerly Torque, Godolphin Arabian, uh, other studs and those uh, small uh, number of mares that they started and then the weather be a stud book was developed after that. Uh, it's very effective, very simple way of uh, keeping track of uh, records. Of course, it has limitation with the uh, gene pool. Uh, the other type of a stud book, which is our focus here today, is open a stud book. Uh, this type of a start book allows breeders to kind of uh, introduce other uh, individuals into the uh, original group of animals that they started their uh, start book with. Uh, it is used uh, for uh, uh, breeding programs uh, that allow inclusion of uh, other individuals of that type of animal, and it's, it's used quite often with conservation of various uh, type of uh, domestic and uh, wildlife. And uh, so if at the time of the formation of the book, there are individuals that are not identified or hard to identify or hard to get a hold of them, this start book is still allows those individuals be entered into the system. But these kind of start books have a strict selection criteria. In our case, is that that's the breed type, the origin of the horse, and uh, those criteria that we consider for pre-foundation horses. 
uh, as I said, it's a very valuable tool for conservation program for endangered population of animals. Two good examples, probably everybody knows about them, is the Perzhvalsky horse and those European bison uh, and the efforts that was put into conservation of these two endangered animals. Uh, the reasons people, as I said, use this kind of uh, Consider this kind of a start book is uh, lack of established population of our uh, interest. Um, in our case, is Caspian, uh, and also it helps to us to uh, preserve uh, and uh, make sure uh, the population uh, is. Uh, uh, not just limited to a uh, small group that we start with and uh, keeps the other one out. Uh, the other uh, example uh, or uh, other reason they are using it uh, is for cross breads. A uh, good example would be quarter horse association that allows appendix horses, which are a mix of thoroughbreds and quarter horses. Hanoverian is another one, which because their criteria, <coughs> their criteria is uh, performance. If even if it's a throwbred Arabian Arabian cross, throwbred cross, if can meet the criteria to meet those performances, they would allow that animal to be part of that stuff. So with this. Uh, kind of introduction, I would like to go to our ICSP or uh, International Caspian Start Book. It's very important for everybody to understand this is an open start book. This is not a closed start book. We don't have anything like a uh, throwbread uh, uh, foundation and we haven't closed the start book. It's only 50 years that this breed was uh, rediscovered. Uh, I personally remember having discussions with uh, Luis about this issue. And uh, this breed still is uh, being uh, kind of recognized. Uh, there are lots of neighboring breeds uh, in the motherland of this animal that uh, might have similarities to this breed that we need to identify them, separate them. On the other hand, there are large number of these uh, Caspians uh, that still are coming out of the group and we need to be open to accept them into uh, the start book, but with very strict and uh, careful uh, criteria. Uh, our pre-foundations uh, are basically uh, those uh, group of uh, Caspians that are coming into this book, and that's why this start book is open. Uh, the main section of this start book uh, um, includes, uh, as I said, pre-foundation, which would be the open part of the start book. I'm not saying this other part, which uh, includes the foundation horses and the pures as is, is, is closed it is still considers uh eliminating the one that do not meet the criteria that was set or basically like what Atisha says they are throwbacks and after a few generations several generations you suddenly see that they are missing some of the criteria so the being open, it's not just accepting in, it also allows us to eliminate those individuals that we consider them not good fit. And then the last group in this start book are category X, which was a necessity uh, that um, came up after, I think up after two decades, when uh, some of the breeders uh, failed to meet the minimum requirements for registrations uh, and rules and regulations. So basically it was a way to not let us lose those bloodlines. Uh, again, when you think about uh, open start book uh, and especially our ICSP, 
it's a combination of collaboration between the breeders, member societies, and those elected officials that member societies are putting as the governors of ICS. You got to understand uh, ICS uh, board of officers and uh, chair and vice chair, everybody's volunteer. Member societies, I don't know, there might be some member, some societies that are for profit and they are responsible for what they do. But the ultimate responsibility, again, lies on the breeder. But the interaction of all these three variables, these two, these three factors, is the one that creates a reliable and uh, valid start book, which would be our ICSB. Uh, up to here, if somebody has any questions, Sarah, are we letting the questions or do you want to continue? I don't see any questions yet. Anybody have any questions? Please raise your hand or put it in the chat at any time. I will, uh, I will uh, let uh, Farshad, Farshad know. Okay. All right. If there is no question, I keep going there. Uh, so let's talk about the uh, International Caspian Society. As I, as I said, this is a team of volunteers. They are basically elected by a representative of each member societies. Uh, and so they are just uh, helping communication and uh, uh, collaboration between these various societies. The objectives of this, uh, of this uh, group is to identify, preserve, and protect the international population of Caspian. And this should be done in accordance with what was described by uh, founder of the breed as the breed type. Uh, they need to make sure the ICSB uh, gathers accurate and traceable record for the individuals that are introduced by member societies as Caspian. And they also need to make sure the DNA, DNA parentage verification has been done, uh, especially for the past 10, 15 years, it has been the main uh, object of this uh, society. And uh, also they are- Ashad, uh, Ashad, if I can interrupt you for a second. Sure. Yes. Uh, there's a few people that say they can't hear, so I'm not oh. sure they can't hear anything or- um, they, Do they're... you guys hear me? I can hear you fine. So, but if you can speak a little louder, that would. Sure, no, I'll, I'll do that. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so, uh, okay, let me go back here. Uh, the, ma the main objectives uh, of uh, International Caspian Society, as I said, is to make sure they help to identify uh, preserve and protect the international uh, population of Caspian. Uh, they are doing it by uh, uh, kind of sticking to the breed type and standard, which was uh, established many years ago. Uh, they wanna make sure there is an accurate and traceable record available for the horses that uh, are uh, listed in the ICSB. Uh, this team of uh, at the ICS has to make sure the DNA parentage verification is there and it's uh, reliable. And also if needed, they might consider investigation or inspections into questionable uh, registry. Uh, the other thing is uh, for the pure section uh, of the start book, which means uh, horses that are going back to the foundation, uh, they, the registration of these horses should be based on the rules and regulation uh, outlined in the Schedule 2 of uh, our rules and regulation. Uh, the, the way that ICSB works is the basically ICSB and registrar of the ICS International Caspian Society compiles and maintain all these, all the detailed information, uh, both for purebred Caspian, which are going back to the foundations, or pre-foundations that are basically from Iran and coming out of uh, 
native uh, herds or uh, Caspian coast. Uh, they use examinations and investigations to make sure, especially with regards to pre-foundation, that uh, they do meet all the criteria needed uh, to enter into ICPFR, which is the section of the ICSP for pre-foundation. Uh, they would definitely uh, double check any uh, questionable uh, pedigree and uh, they need to make sure those details information such as identification, uh, transfer of ownership, uh, movement of the horses, all these things have been transferred by the breeders to the member society and finally to the uh, ICSB. And ICS uh, is supposed to publish uh, the start book uh, once a year. Now let's talk about the member societies and what are they uh, supposed to do and help. Uh, Sari, is it good now or should I speak louder? Uh, I think there's just a few people I can't figure out. Right. You maybe, um, but everyone else seems to hear you fine. So okay, uh, I can't get closer to this to my computer. <laughs> the um, so uh, these member societies are basically uh, the uh, working bodies of the ICS. Uh, they are uh, the national or regional uh, um, channel for communication between breeders and the ICS. And these are usually uh, formed by the breeders and owners in those areas uh, who are breeding Caspians. Primary goals for uh, these members uh, societies or is to uh, or are to create and maintain the national regional start books. So each one of them should have their own start books. They should have their own rules and regulation based on the minimum requirements that are listed in the IC uh, S's, uh, rules and regulation. And they are supposed to regularly update uh, the information that uh, we need to make sure our start book is current. This is where usually the problems happen. If there is a mistake in entering the sex of the animal, the name of the animal, age of the animal, all those things, if you don't, if member societies don't fix them in a timely manner, manner then it would become a problem years down the road when the ICS's board has changed, the registrar has changed, and now to have, you have to go and trace everything back. Uh, the mission, the main mission of these uh, uh, member societies uh, uh, includes uh, a kind of uh, close collaboration with the breeders and uh, their elected officials, which would be those who are sitting at the member society and ICS. And by this collaboration, everybody is trying to make sure the collected data is uh, current, is reliable, and there is an old saying, they say garbage in, garbage out. If we don't put proper, accurate information in the submission forms, when you give it to your member societies, then we're gonna be in trouble. And the member society registrars are supposed to double check these things. Uh, these, uh, Member societies also need to make sure there is a continuity in publication of the regional start books, Iran, uh, USA, uh, England, everybody should make sure the regional start books is published regularly and people can have access to them. Now let's go to breeders. Basically breeders, as I said, are the one who start this cascade of transfer of information. They are the backbone of this start book. That, that's my main focus of this talk today about the ICSP today. And they are the primary collector and submitter of all those information listed here, all those identifiers, the color of the horse, uh, the markings of the horse. Uh, if they have, there is a marker sheet, all those details need to be carefully put on those papers and submitted to the member societies. Uh, 
uh, breeders also should bear in mind that if they don't participate, uh, of course, in a uh, 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 proper, respectful, and uh, not emotional manner, a uh, very um, kind of um, logical, because it seems when we deal with endangered animal, emotions get high, and uh, sometimes the logic goes out of the window. But they we need all the breeders, which are not that many, to be involved and uh, participate. They need to make sure, uh, again, they submit the accurate information to uh, their member societies and from there to the ICS. And also the most important part is after they submit the information, when the book comes out, it's their job to go to find those details that must that might be a human error. Somebody by mistake puts the mare, mare as a stallion or uh, colors could change from bay to chestnut just by a click of a uh, computer. Uh, a key, a key. Uh, so be careful when you get the start book, make sure you go and review it. So after talking about the start book, let's talk about what do we gain from a start book. Sarvi, is there any question? Should I continue? Yes, please continue, no questions yet. All right. So one of the simple things we can get from a start book is what happened during the past 50 years. Uh, these are, this is a graph that shows how it started in 1973, and you can see there were... There, uh, Hi, this is Maple Farm. I'm returning pardon? your call. Oh. Is somebody asking a question, Sarvi? No, sorry, Fasha. Somebody was unmuted. I muted. Oh, all right. Okay. Uh, so basically, uh, again, this shows us how the population changed uh, throughout the years. And you can see we have a really uh, spike uh, between 1994 to around 2007. And you can see a decline from there. So this is kind of uh, historical information, but can give us some idea if to worry or no. Also from this spot book, we can learn how horses were moved around the world. Uh, the big uh, fat red line um, highlights the main export of the Caspian from Iran. Then almost all of them went to England. And all those tiny little blue lines are the export of progenies of those uh, initial group of uh, foundation Caspians uh, from England to other places. Considering today we are talking about CHSA and United States, I uh, highlighted the export of uh, Caspian horses from around the world to uh, USA. It's just, um, it's interesting, but it doesn't have much to do with the uh, breed uh, in USA that two basically initial horses that uh, exported from Iran, Jahan and uh, uh, Mehrgan uh, were exported from Iran directly to <clears throat> uh, USA. Uh, so that's another value of uh, having a start book that is accurate. I got this slide from uh, Mr. Ramazani Adirza, who is the ICSS registrar. This slide, gives us a kind of a good idea during the past 10 years, different uh, member societies, how they contributed to a uh, start book that we call ICSB. As you can see, uh, England has been consistently providing uh, a number of uh, registry every year, same with USA. Uh, Sweden has been consistent there uh, with their small number. There are other societies that were, they have not been as consistent, including uh, Iranian uh, uh, registry. Uh, and of course, there are lots of troubles back there. Uh, and we all hope everything uh, be more consistent and more uh, calm back there for them. The other uh, information we can get from uh, IC, 
ESP, which is very important for all of us, is the demography of the Caspian population. Uh, if you, this, these are some of the numbers that I kind of crunch out of uh, ICSB. If you look at uh, the, this ICSB uh, can let us know how many of horses are alive, how many are dead. It's, of course, it depends if people reported death. I myself know of many people who have just shot them uh, and buried them and nobody knows about them. But this is the this is the number, this is the table. It tells us how many of uh, uh, those male or female are available to us. Most important, uh, it will tell us how many were gelded. And the most important part is we might have 2,000 horses registered there. But to be honest with you, only those who are 20 years or younger are valuable for us to save the breed. And as you can see, when I crunch the numbers, if I am right, we hardly have about 820 of them left. Uh, also, uh, if you are thinking about a uh, different age group in that 2025 20, uh, category of uh, what's registered in the start book, then you end up with these kind of uh, charts that would help us and breeders to understand how good or how bad is our situation with conservation of Caspian. If you look at these charts, uh, you can easily see uh, that we only, if if these numbers, of course, if members, breeders, uh, member societies and breeders participate, we have only 90 less than five years old, five year old horses registered. When you go to five to 10 years, it's only 120. Uh, five to 10 years is the age of the Caspian that you, if you want to take it to a show, that's when you start. I don't think you want to take a 20, 25 year old Caspian to a show. And when it comes to breeding, uh, I have a little bit of experience with reproduction. I don't want to work with horses that are going past 15, 20. Uh, that's just I'm wasting my time and my client's money. Uh, again, uh, this question is always circulating. Is Caspian endangered animal? Well, you guys look at these numbers, and I'm just going to go through more of these graphs and numbers with you. Uh, you definitely see a sharp decline. Uh, I'm going back only about 20, 25 years back. And uh, the other uh, thing which is very important is when you look at the bird uh, ratio, uh, what I did uh, is I created this table which gives us the numbers uh, for mares under 20 years old. Uh, both mare and stallions, because these are, are producing animals. And then for each year, the number of foals that were registered for that year are here. Forget about this table is like a uh, headache to look at it. This graph speaks for itself. When you look at the birth ratio from 1980 or 1985 ish, there's almost 40 uh, times decline in the birth ratio of uh, Caspian. Uh, and this is really, really concerning. Uh, I'm more than happy to discuss it further. And I hope uh, if others have got explanation about it, we can discuss it. Uh, yes. We, we had a comment on the chat. Uh, mm -hmm. If this was uh, worldwide numbers, uh, we did. Yes, I, yeah, I'm. I'm still in the worldwide. Let's let's get to the CHSA. We are not there yet. Just wait. Yeah. Uh, so now we are getting to the Caspian registration in the North America. Uh, if there is any question, let me answer those before I get into this one. Yeah, just a comment that a lot of horses are not in the ICSB, but uh, I'm not sure. What yes, yes, yeah, uh, uh, I, I kind of uh, know about that, but 
we get there. But let's talk about the registration of Caspians uh, in North America. Uh, as you can see, uh, the import was between those years of 1994 to 2004. And this graph shows a rapid uh, uh, increase in the numbers. Uh, and, and these are the numbers that have been reported to uh, ICS. And I think until 2008 or nine, there was continuous uh, report uh, to ICS. Uh, this graph is, a, this is about the horses that were reported from North America to ICS and the ICSB has got, re, uh, can, we can uh, refer to them. So this graph shows you <clears throat> uh, the uh, total number registered, which is in red. Those who are, mm, listed as alive and again if the breeders didn't bother or they didn't get a chance or they lost their communication for whatever reason it's hard to believe after 2009 we don't have any dead animal do you see that there from uh, you have reports reports of death until 2009 and after that there's only report of birth so I think even in North America, our most educated horse owners maybe uh, need to reconsider their contribution to uh, data uh, collection and sharing. But this is concerning. I mean, the, in either way, there is a decline and I'm gonna go through that. Uh, and uh, when you, again, uh, look at the numbers uh, for the Caspian population and you graph it based on the age categories, uh, this, this particular graph here is very concerning. Uh, and I hope people can comment on this. Uh, on the very top bar, you have 50, um, uh, five percent of the population, which is reported to be 20 years old or uh, younger, 55% of them are on the top. Uh, then you have 19% in the 15 uh, years old category. And then uh, you come down to 4% reported for the new generation. This, this is like a, a funnel that is gonna, it not, this column cannot stand on this narrow base forever. Years ago, I think in 2008 or nine, you probably had a square column here because the number of folds in the age of five to 10 were almost close to the older one. But this graph definitely shows this trend cannot continue. I can't imagine even those who haven't reported, and there are other groups I know they are working hard to gather and keep uh, their, their kind of keepers of the information. But even if they put their numbers here, I can't imagine you can increase the numbers uh, to what uh, your 55% of the uh, population is going to be. So we have almost 600 uh, individuals in the age of uh, uh, less than uh, 20 years old. And you can see here again, this graph is this one, but uh, on a kind of histogram here. And you can see uh, out of that 600, again, almost 350 of them reported are 20 years old. I can't imagine we have 350 horses that within the past uh, few years have not been reported. And if it is, that's good. We need to put all this information together. All right, so uh, after carefully reviewing the ICSP, unfortunately, there is a significant drop in the registration and a sharp decline in participation of the breeders and of course, member societies in updating and making the data accurate for 
everybody around the world in Europe, uh, Iran or Australia to use that information. Sari, should I stop here or should I continue? Does anybody have any questions up to this point or any comments they would like to share? Nothing, Farshad, so please continue. All right, so, uh, you know, uh, I, uh, I started with explaining what's a start book. I tried to explain what are the elements that make an start book reliable and uh, useful. And then I try to review whatever reliable published information is available to us, and that's ICSB. Uh, and I think if you can look at this information, this data yourself. It seems we are dealing definitely with an endangered breed. So uh, I, uh, after this, uh, part of the discussion, uh, we have some practical challenges that we need to address. And uh, I know Mary has got some uh, 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 ideas that she wants to share with us. And Mary, if you are ready, I can pass uh, uh, the presentation to you. Uh, if you want to start talking about the those non-conforming and how we might be able to help uh, bringing them back into the uh, start book. Um, yeah, I can um, pick up that topic. I guess um, I, I, have... was mm -hmm. I was wondering if um, if anybody else had had comments or questions before we maybe um, change gear a little bit. I think one comment that was made, uh, I don't know uh, who is there, that uh, <clears throat> about uh, uh, those uh, Caspians in North America, which I know quite a bit about them, uh, that uh, their breeders, their owners for many different various reasons, um, uh, their taste was different, their uh, ideas was were different, uh, their, uh, they were busy, um, you know, they got family issues, uh, sicknesses, for whatever reason, they failed to report and then it just got behind. Uh, many of them really fit in this non-conforming group that I think you want to address. Uh, and uh, again, uh, these people who are trying to keep track of this information, they are keepers and their job and their work is really appreciated, but uh, individuals cannot carry this uh, breed uh, out of uh, that danger zone. <laughs> It's a it's a teamwork. Everybody has to come together. So if you want, I can start this part of the conversation today. Sure. Do you want to, um, me to pick up this topic? So um, the term that we're using here is mainstreaming. And the definition of that, of course, is to bring into the accepted norm. And the goal for mainstreaming of Caspian horses would, bring, would be to bring horses that have a verifiable Caspian parentage back into the ICSB. So we have a number of... Um, people that purchase a horse that is not ICSB registered or eligible for various reasons. And what we would like to do is to help these horses get in the ICSB so that they can become part of the larger Caspian gene pool and um, 
and also, you know, contribute to that gene pool. So one of the main um, issues that we have seen in CHSA that comes to us is that um, a Caspian was sired by a stallion that did not have a stallion license. And of course, that is a requirement of ICSB. It's a requirement that um, Louise initiated years and years ago. So um, the CHSA has to follow that because they are part of the International Caspian Society. So in this case, um, this is a pedigree of a horse that we're gonna call Desert Rose over there on, on the left in the pink. And then her pedigree um, follows moving to the right. Um, boys are blue, girls are pink. And as you can see, her sire was not eligible for ICS um, B entry because he did not have a stallion license. But if we go back one generation, those horses were ICS B Caspians. And because we have the DNA trail from the grandparents to the parent and now to the offspring, we have solid proof that Desert Rose descended from ICSB Caspians. So what we have done, what the CHSA is asking of the ICS is to make exceptions in cases like this so that we can register De Desert Rose and get her in the ICSB, put her into the larger breeding population of ICSB horses and preserve her genetic material um, into the future. So I don't know if there are, are questions or comments about that, but. I'm catching up on some of the chat. So I, do people have, do people want to have a conversation about this or? There are people that, uh, Mary Sarvi, um, there are people that have some questions but are concerned it might get very uh, fiery. Um, I, I suggest to people to ask the questions. Let's, this is why we're here. Let's have a conversation. Um, I'm here as moderator. If it gets out of control, I will try and keep everybody under control. So ask away. Uh, we just have a comment from Paula that she does not agree with the stallion licensing. Um, I'm not sure this is the venue to talk about that. Unless Mary or well, I can, I can, I can, I can, I can speak to that. Um, I certainly understand people's skepticism of stallion licensing. Um, I also breed a number of warm blood breeds, and stallion licensing in these warm bloods. I'll take Dutch warm bloods as an example. Is an extremely intensive process. Um, takes a lot of money and a lot of time, um, takes at least three or four years to get a stallion fully licensed within some of the warm blood registries. And that's because, you know, they have um, radiographic exams, they have endoscopic exams, they have performance criteria, you know, all of these things. So, you know, obviously the Caspian cannot attain that level of stallion licensing. Um, and so, you know, because our stallion licensing exam is granted a somewhat cursory exam, um, I, I am certainly willing to have that discussion. Um, and, and I would certainly be willing to take that 
to the ICS to discuss that. The things that I would point out is that stallion licensing came from Louise Carruz. And that's how it got into the ICS rules for registration. And that's why a group like CHSA has to follow that rule. So if, if we don't have rules, we don't have a registry. It's a free for all. So I personally am not sold on stallion licensing as in the way that we do it for, for Caspians. You know, I, I don't find it particularly valuable, but I don't set the rules. And if I want to play the game, I follow the rules. So, you know, we can have this discussion about the potential for eliminating stallion licensing, but you have to be in the game in order to change the rules. You know, you can't change the rules from the outside. So uh, that that's kind of where I stand on stallion licensing. And if people have, you know, particular, I, I mean, horses are expensive. Yeah. Okay. So it's another vet visit, or I mean, you should double it up with some other vet visit they are having to get your stallion inspected. It's not a high bar. Um, it's it's not hard to do. It costs what twenty twenty five dollars? I mean, really? Are we gonna you know go to go to war about twenty five dollars? I spend more than that on a bag of feed. So you know, I I feel like people have um, kind of chosen a particular point and said, well, I don't agree with that, and then just gone their own way with it. And I find that, you know, detrimental to the overall good of the breed. Uh, Mary, may I make a point? Uh, I uh, I have worked with Caspian basically all my um, past 30 years since I graduated. Uh, I have seen many uh, crypto orchids in Caspians. I think it's, I, I don't have any study, I don't have the numbers, but I work with other horses too. Uh, 2000, I think it was 2015, just a year or 16, just before uh, Terry Stewart passed away. Uh, I was called to his farm and I castrated 27 stallions at that farm. Out of 27, we had two or three that were single. And I have, here I have brought 20 horses down here to BC and I try to find home for them. One of them was Crypto Kit, was actually used as the stallion. I, I know that for a fact. And I, I think nobody checked it. And we had to go inside the abdomen, remove the testicle, which you know is pretty expensive. It's not a simple surgery. And now I am dealing with another foal that is out of another stallion down here that we are trying to hormonally help at least it becomes inguinal rather than abdominal. So my point is uh, this, and I, I, again, going back to a few years that I spent working with Louise, that was a concern back there too. So there was a reason they put it there. The problem is none of these ICS's rules and regulation for the past 25 years have specified what is the extent of a stallion inspection. I think if member societies, including CHSA, sits down and gives a guideline, you are right, with 25 bucks, a vet just puts his hand down there and says it's got 201. That's good enough. <laughs> Yeah, parrot mouth, uh, those kind of things. I mean, those are you don't need to do DNA tests or you don't need to do extensive X rays. I don't think that's what uh, is uh, being discussed here. And I think education and understanding of very basic uh, g uh, diseases that could be hereditary and passing along that could be just as I said, put your hands down there. Even even some owners can do it themselves. You don't need a vet. 
but it's better to have a look. And if that's the problem, stop breathing with that stomach. So I, I'm curious, uh, you know, when people that have very strong objections to the stallion license, is it mostly about the expense or is it is it something else? I think it's a question that should be emailed to people and get written answer. I don't think people are going to. Sarvi, could I answer that? Uh, sure, just uh, announce who you are, please. I don't know who you are. I'm Jessica. Oh, hi, Jessica. Jessica York. <laughs> I have to say, it's nice to see all your faces. I talked to some of you and I. it's really great to put the face to the name. Um, I am in Northern Maine. I have a fairly large Caspian herd here. Um, and I think for me personally, licensing stallions um, it's really hard to do because we don't have veterinarians. Um, I have a dog vet, a small animal vet, but when he comes to the farm to look at stallions and certainly he can check whether there are two testicles or one, but I can also do that. Um, and I find that I don't have a vet here that, um, could look at a stallion and know more than myself about whether they should be bred or they shouldn't. I don't know who else is in that situation. Um, I have to trailer my horses to the vet for everything. And so $25 is not a reality. Um, the dog vet, he, he really doesn't get stallion quality or even genetic horse problems in general. Um, so for me, it's kind of a moot point, but also I feel that in the past, we've had a couple of incidents where a vet that may or may not have been a dog vet um, looked at a horse and made a judgment call that did take maybe an important stallion out of our deed pool. And that I find is quite harmful. I, I agree that um, if, if a stallion candidate fails the stallion test or the stallion inspection, I guess I would, well, I, I know a lot of bad stuff has happened in the past and I don't even wanna know what some of it was. Um, I feel like going forward that if a stallion were to fail, so to speak, a, a, a stallion inspection that I would like the board to weigh in on that. And yeah, you know, you can make a horse look parrot mouth if you take, you know, if you look at it with its head, you know, up in the air. Yeah, that it's it's artificial. Um, but what I would I would like to do is, you know, in addition to having a real serious discussion about the value of stallion testing and licensing, um, would be to have the board involved in uh, making sure that we're doing the best by everyone. Um, I mean, there's been a lot of bad stuff that's happened in the past, and I don't know, you know, how to remedy that aside from setting some new principles and moving forward and having a, a temperate um, group of people that try to keep things on an even keel. May I answer that? Go ahead, Jessica. I I think that that's correct, and I think part of um, part of the current issue is that there's a lot of new science, and um, especially with DNA, right? Um, we do parent verify. We have a parent verified population here, and with that new science, it it slightly takes away the um, authority, let's say, of the registry um, only with data. And I'm not saying that I don't believe that the registry should exist. I think that it has to pivot a little bit 
about why it exists to serve the population. And that now that we have that science and it's available to everyone, um, it, it just changes the game a little bit and it's gonna keep happening, I feel. So I really feel like the registry has to keep an open mind, stay on its toes, not always adhere to old traditions um, and really think about the survival and success of the breed before those traditions in, in every case, because things are changing rapidly. And those of us who do keep track of the Caspian population um, here in North America, but also in the world, understand that what Dr. Frashad is saying is true. You know, it's scary. There are issues. Um, we're losing genetic data pretty fast. Uh, other genetic data is not being tracked by, um, you know, everybody involved. And the reciprocation is, you know, that's a tough one. I mean, we really need to be able to work together and it, it's going to take um, compromise and not just standing on our, on our soapbox, on, on our own soapboxes and saying it's my way or the highway. It's not going to work either way. And so I do feel like open discussions like this are necessary and good. Yeah, I appreciate that. I, you're right. I mean, there is there are a lot of advances in DNA, and the whole premise of mainstreaming this picture that's up here right now and what we're trying to do, it's all dependent on the parent verification, you know, the DNA testing. So yeah, let's use that tool, and you know, keep horses in the the breeding population rather than you know, bumping them out for what some would call technicalities. Um, I would like to address the technicalities and try to eliminate them um, as best we can. Um, but I guess by the same token, um, the what I will characterize as the splinter groups of Caspians in North America, um, you know, they have splintered for their rationales, for their reasons. And I feel like maybe um, they need to re-examine, you know, their, their rationale as well. Okay, I'm gonna step in here and, and uh, I wanna thank Jessica for her comments. I think they're uh, very rational. I wanna thank the CHSA board. I've been, uh, the guest chair of their board now for going on five years. And we've been working on eliminating roadblocks, uh, beginning with this uh, election. There are no uh, holdovers from the previous board whatsoever. Uh, we have new ideas. We have lots of people that want to make this work. And I think all of us who are in attendance today would say that we've got to figure out a way to keep the Caspian breed viable. And uh, so I think from now on, these conversations need to continue. We need to find a pathway for everybody to participate and uh, have a good access to a gene pool that makes the Caspian breed uh, thrive. So on that note, unless there are any other comments, um, we're going to switch to the uh, uh, annual members meeting. Uh, but if there's any comments that need to be made, uh, let's make them now. Thank you.